Hey there, study buddy. It's that Sunday school girl of that Sunday school girl.com. I'm here and you're here. That means that together we're checking out the lesson for this Sunday, October 25th. Hope that you had a really good week. I'm just so glad that I don't look like what I've been through. But then again, maybe with this hat on today, I do look like what I've been through. Because this is pretty much what I've been through. But in all seriousness, thank you so much for checking out the lesson with me. I know that it's the weekend. That means great fun with family and friends. But I'm going to ask you to make Sunday school a part of your weekend agenda. This video comes to you each week for three reasons. Number one, to encourage you to make Sunday school part of that regular weekend routine. So I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe it means getting your family up on Sunday morning. Maybe it's that you and a group of friends watch this video and and discuss the lesson together, but whatever it is, it's so important that we get in and study God's word. Secondly, for those of you who do go to class, and yes, I know that some of you are still cheating, you haven't even tried to set your alarm clock, do that for me this week. And when you get to class, don't go in there sitting in the back of the room with your arms folded, but you're going to get in there and be an active part of the discussion. Our teachers don't show up to lecture us. That's no fun, but we can help those classes become alive and engaging. Lastly, that we understand how to incorporate and how to activate God's word in our everyday lives. It really is the word of God that helps us to understand how we should act and how we should handle different situations when they come our way. So give it a chance. Put Sunday school on your list of things to do. Listen, if you are new around here, welcome. You're joining one of the largest cyber communities for Sunday school study on the World Wide Web, and we're thrilled that you're here. Do me a favor, click like and take a moment and share this video over to your wall so that others can be blessed by the ministry of Sunday school. Let's talk about the lesson. Depending on your publisher this week, your lesson title is Peter Defends His Actions or... If it is you am I or power for living, your title is trusting the spirit. The Bible basis is Acts chapter 11 verses 1 through 18. The Bible truth, Peter's testimony to the power of the Holy Spirit converting Gentiles increased Jerusalem's church support of Peter. The memory verse is verse 17. And the lesson aim is that we will learn that Peter's preaching to the Gentiles was affirmed by believers in Jerusalem feel comfortable reaching out to different people and identify Christian scriptures that include all in the body of Christ. So we are continuing to study the book of Acts, which we've done all quarter. And this lesson in particular carries over from last week. So if you were not in class last week, you might think about pausing right here and going back and taking a look at the lesson or running through last week's video because it is a direct link to that. So for the most part, like you've missed the first half of the movie. Um, we see that the church is still new. You still got a new group of people, this incredible message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The people have been scattered, so it's starting to spread throughout the area, throughout the region. They're in different places. But the thing about it is, and this always interests me, that for communities that were sometimes 30 or 40 miles apart and people who didn't have internet and who were walking, Words still travel so quickly. And that's what Peter is going to be defending against today is word that has traveled quickly. Um, about the fact that in last week's lesson, Peter preached. He took a risk and he preached to a Gentile man and his family. He did this in the man's house. Why was that important? Because again, the Jews and the Gentiles in modern day urban dictionary dot com type terms, felt some kind of way about each other. I mean, the Jews thought the Gentiles were unclean. The Gentiles thought the Jews were uptight and ritualistic and ceremonial. So they had no appreciation for them. And so they really had no dealings with each other. And here is this preacher who has gone against the law, even taking a risk by sharing, not just sharing, but in his home, sharing the message of Christ. And that word has gotten back to the city. So in verse one, you should note that there are actually two groups of people. Luke takes time to distinguish that there are the apostles and believers, and then there are the uncircumcised believers. And their responses to what's gone on is actually different. The apostles and the believers are happy that the message of Jesus Christ has been spread. You know, it was different for the Gentiles to receive it, but, you know, nonetheless, the word of God was spreading, and that was something that was really exciting. The circumcised believers, on the other hand, they wanted 
to be happy, I guess, that the message was going on, but they were so caught up in the rules and how things were done and the fact that Peter had gone into the home of this Gentile man that they couldn't see the good and what had taken place, the work that had taken place for the kingdom. They were immediately ready to jump on Peter and criticize him. And this is the place of conflict that we entered the lesson on today. It wasn't that they were overly critical about Peter baptizing Cornelius. It was specifically the fact that Peter had gone into Cornelius' house. You even remember last week's lesson in chapter 10, verse 28. Um, Peter acknowledged himself that it was unlawful for him to even be walking into Cornelius' Cornelius's house. And so everyone acknowledged that this was really, really different. And they said, not only did you go into his house, you went into the home of an uncircumcised man and you ate with him. That was a level of fellowship. Think about it. You don't just allow anyone into your home. You certainly don't allow just anyone to come into your home and sit at your table and have that level of fellowship. And so again, that was their contention with Peter was that he went into his home and specifically shared a meal with him, a sign of fellowship. Again, in a time when the culture was not open to these two groups of people even being together. So it was a compromise in their minds that Peter had made for the sharing of the gospel. It was a really new idea for them. It was it was hard for them to believe that you did not have to become a Jew first to take on all of their ways, their practices, the circumcision to receive Jesus Christ. It was hard for them to believe that it was simply repent and accept God into your heart. They wanted all of these other kind of ceremonial things to have been done. So again, their accusations were really more out of their religious perspective. Um, their objective objection was not so much to what God had done, but it was specifically what Peter had done. So his crit his critics were, you know, again, criticizing the work that had been done. And even though it was real kingdom work, there was real ministry going on. It even happens now that there are some people, there are situations where people can be so critical about the work that's being done. And a lot of times without having all of the facts, these accusers did not even have all of the facts. So as you're reading through this lesson, and as you're thinking about personal reflection, I am hopeful that you'll think about criticism, even in your own life, criticism in the way that you look at things. And we too have to be careful about and be mindful about how quickly criticism can roll off of our own tongues. When we see things from our own lens and our own perspective, that doesn't always mean that God isn't working. And so I think that was important in verse one, Peter's reaction to their criticism. And think about that. When we get criticized, we don't like it. It doesn't feel good. And we instinctively want to go into a defensive mode or an argumentative mode. That doesn't seem to be Peter's approach. He doesn't respond by losing his temper or in a lot of emotion. He simply goes back to recapping exactly what happened. In this part, I want you to be careful because it does recap the lesson from last week. But be careful even in repetition in scripture that you view it as something important. There are lessons that we should get. Don't underestimate this portion of the text just because we've seen it before. But he goes back and he talks about the fact that he was on a rooftop in Joppa and I see this vision. There's a sheet that comes out of heaven and all I see on this sheet are all these different kinds of creatures and, and four-legged beasts and you can probably just get really creative in your own mind. Let's be clear, sheets dropping out of skies and animals on them, this is not normal. So Peter knows that there is something about this vision that he's supposed to get and in it he hears a voice saying to arise, slay, and eat. His response was, oh no, not me, Lord. My lips have never touched anything unclean. Nothing unclean has entered my mouth. But the voice answered him the same three times from heaven saying to arise, to kill and eat. In this portion of the lesson, I really thought about our personal convictions. And there are so many things that we have learned, whether it's things from our families, the way that we've been socialized in general. But we have to be really careful to watch our convictions and make sure that we're thinking about and understanding why we believe what we believe and making sure that we're sensitive even when God is trying to give us new revelation on things. So in this situation, we see that a conviction, not specifically on the matter of food, but the revelation that he gets is around people. And in the fact that there is nothing that God has made that 
we should call unclean in terms of his people. And so this, again, was a different conviction than what Peter had had in the past. So again, for us, I think about, I laugh sometimes with my, uh, remembering my dad. Uh, and I'm not saying that they're right, wrong, or indifferent, but my dad did not go to the picture show. No picture show for him because when he grew up, they told him that the picture show, the saints didn't go to the picture show, no movies. And so he didn't have a problem that, you know, that we may go to the cinema, the theater from time to time. But there was no getting my dad in, no matter how much popcorn, because that was just his conviction. So this this portion, again, for me, was really about conviction. But again, what he heard three times was a message that what God had created, he was not to call unclean. That was the, the, the revelation of that vision. Again, we get into our own habits. We get into the ways that we like things done. We're not always easy to change. There was a business book that came out a few years ago that was entitled, Who Moved My Cheese? And really about this idea that we like our stuff. We like our stuff just the way we have it. And we're not always open to change and new ideas and thinking about things in different ways. I also remember my grandmother before she passed away. And she just says, I'm just so worried that you're getting set in your ways. And I learned to understand that that just meant you don't like to change and we're all guilty of it. So again, this was really a message, this idea that something could be different. And it was the spirit. It was specifically the spirit who told Peter to go to Cornelius's house. And that's important. When you do things, you need to make sure of who told you to do what you're doing. But it was the spirit who told him to go. And he takes six brethren with him. And this is the first time I think that we see it was the number six. Just some, um, I don't want to call it random Bible trivia, but you know, I come, I'm kind of a nerd. So in Egyptian law, it was important to have seven witnesses. Um, and in Roman law, it was important to have seven seals to approve a document. So the Jews knew the Egyptian and the Roman law very well. So if you need seven witnesses to prove a case, Peter plus his six brethren that he took with him made the seven witnesses that could testify as to what happened in the home of Cornelius. Um, it was important that he took witnesses. Maybe we didn't understand last week and we kind of read over the fact that he took some brethren with him, but now we see that it was really important. The Bible talks about having witnesses. Uh, Matthew 18 talks about having two or three witnesses to resolve a dispute. If you go back to Deuteronomy 19 uh, verses 15, 16, um, it talks about witnesses witnesses and the importance of having witnesses. So that's really important that you pull that out in, in your study as well. So again, be sure that it's the spirit of God who calls you to do what you do. Uh, Peter goes on to explain that when I got there, they were waiting on me. There was great anticipation. They were excited to receive the word. And he went into this man's house, even though he knew it was unlawful. And when he went there, this was, this stood out to me. He says that I remembered the word. Like I knew that you would think that it was unlawful for me to be there, but then I remembered the word. Now for you preachers, you can write that down because I know you're going to preach that somewhere one day. Then I remembered because he remembered what God's word said. And it talked about the fact that everyone would have the option to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And there are times that we have to remember what God's word says. Have you ever had to recall God's word? Think about situations in your life where you've had to recall God's word. What types of situations were they and what did it mean to you to be able to recall God's word? And in recalling God's word, here's what Peter knew, that there was nothing that could withstand God. And when he responded to his critics in this way, their response changed. Their criticism ceased and it turned into worship. Um, the Bible says that they became silent and that they also glorify God. Again, this is a powerful moment because it shows a change of heart of those Jewish, Jewish Christians to being open to the fact that the gospel really was for everyone. Here are my lesson learnings for this week. Be careful of being critical. Secondly, God doesn't need us for his plan to succeed. Whenever we resist the will of God, we miss out on the best that God has for us. Third, we should be careful not to get in God's way when things need to change. Fourth, we live in a critical world, but we must rise above it. At some point, it is pointless to continue to try to defend yourself or explain your actions. The fifth thing was that Peter recognized the importance of sensing 
where God is going and heading. And he tried to align himself to go in that same direction instead of persuading God to go his direction. So we should do that thinking about how God wants things to be and not trying to push our own way and our own agenda. And again, just a reiteration from last week, God wants all people to enjoy, to receive, to have the benefit of the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That means you, that means me, that means everyone, no matter what they've done, no matter what their background, whether that's an ethnic background or anything that anyone has done, the message of Jesus Christ really is for everyone. Before I run, I want to remind you that tomorrow night at 9 o'clock p.m., Superintendent Michael Payton and the Illinois First Family will be on the Saturday night conference call. Listen, in the spirit of that group. Let me just tell you that Superintendent Peyton and I, that's my brother, and we do work so well in ministry together. And if you happen to be a part of the Church of God in Christ, we together will be hosting a social on Saturday night, November the 7th. It's actually a Saturday afternoon, and it's the Saturday night that Saturday night Sunday school social. So it's a joint effort of that Sunday school girl and the Saturday night Sunday school line. And we're just going to have some fellowship time at a place called Southern in St. Louis. Um, so it's about 10 minutes from the convention center, 2.30 in the afternoon. It really just is food, fun, and fellowship. Bring your wallet. We don't, we don't have a... Um, we don't have a sponsor just yet, but you know, if there's a sponsor watching and you wish to sponsor, we're accepting sponsors, but otherwise just be prepared to come and enjoy each other. Uh, someone has already asked, are we going to be discussing the lesson? We're primarily going to socialize, but we're Sunday school students and teachers and all of that. And so I can't promise you that the lesson won't come up, but it'll be a great time to meet some of the people that perhaps you've even interacted with here in the social space. It'll be a great time to put, you know, live faces with those profile pictures. We'll see if we really look like those profile pictures. So tomorrow night, join Superintendent Payton at 9 o'clock p.m., area code 605 Four seven five three two three five. The access code is one seven zero zero four five. Second thing I want you to know is if you happen to be a part of the Church of God in Christ and you are attending the Holy Convocation in St. Louis, the International Sunday School Department, Bishop Alton Gatlin, is looking for five hundred teachers to be a part of the largest live Sunday school in the world on Sunday morning in the Convention Center, the Edward R. Jones Dome, I believe, in St. Louis, Missouri. So we're looking for 500 teachers. I will post the link on um, both of my pages if you're interested. It's really easy. Click right through and add your info and you'll get a phone call reminding you and a wake up call that morning because it's an early start, but it's so much fun. Um, and also, as you know, I'll post Dr. Danette Verche's SoundCloud if she's posted it. Otherwise, go off and have a super fantastic weekend. Again, share this video with someone. And most of all, if there's something that you got out of the lesson that could be a benefit to someone else, be sure to leave it in the comments. Have a super weekend. Bye-bye.